us bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much once again for this tremendous opportunity to gather together as family in the unity of the faith, Father, a faith that you've provided each one of us by grace. Father, thank you for the good news about your Son and thank you for saving us by it, and giving us this phenomenal opportunity to spread the good news to a world that just needs it so desperately, Father. What a privilege this is. May we never become discouraged, but encouraged by your patience, your mercy, and your love in doing so. Father, we pray for those in the congregation that are ill and can't be with us this morning. And we pray also for those in this world that are still lost. Father, we're most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt and make a morning like this a reality even. We do just ask your blessings on this morning's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, what is repentance and who gets to define it? I hope you haven't been uh, missing this point. It's a phenomenal series that we're on. Uh, a wonderful sort of cut into the gospel proper, even. Uh, I do want to give you and start with an individual by the name of I.C. Herendine, who some of you have not heard of, but uh, I want to quote him nonetheless. For salvation, quote, repentance unto life is just as necessary as is, as is faith in Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, for salvation, repentance unto life is just as necessary as is faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. No sinner was ever pardoned while he remained impenitent, while he remained in rebellion against God and his authority, and without submitting himself wholeheartedly to his lordship. This involves the realization in his heart, wrought therein by the Holy Spirit, of the, quote, sinfulness of sin, Romans 7.13, of the awfulness of of ignoring the claims of God and of defying His authority. Repentance is a, quote, holy horror and hatred of sin, a deep sorrow for it, a contrite acknowledgement of it before God, and a complete here forsaking of it. That's really what the Spirit's been saying from the pulpit. That's what, the, that's what Holy Scripture teaches us. And we think we've been learning and using David as an example. What was David, a man after God's own heart, described by God as such, as the Word of God describes him? He hated sin. He had a contrite heart towards it. He was broken down because of it, even in his own life. Doesn't mean he wasn't saved or he was fearing for his salvation. It means he hated sin. I mean, who here wants to raise a hand and say in the presence of the Almighty God that you love sin from your new self? Of course your old self loves it. But if you're saved, you have a certain repentance towards sin. You despise it even. And just for the record, I'm always humbled when another person is able to say something that takes me much longer to say. I look at Herendine's word in three slides and it almost encapsulates everything I've been teaching on the subject to date. <clears throat> so I'm always humble when another person is able to say something that takes me personally much longer to say, but I feel utterly blessed to be able to at least share such things with you, my beloved congregation. So forgive me for not being a perfect teacher. And I don't say that tongue-in-cheek. I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm not. I mean that sincerely with all my heart. Forgive me for being an imperfect teacher. I don't teach perfectly. There was only one perfect teacher ever, and his name was Jesus. So just, what am I supposed to do? With that said, let's begin this morning with a little side note the Spirit gave us at the start of Thursday's class. Now, you need to concentrate 
Um, first, since we are commanded to repent, to believe, to have faith, it is righteous to say that we are handed personal accountability to God on the topic of our own salvation. Is that fair? Yeah. We have been given personal accountability on the topic of our own salvation. And regarding said salvation, the Bible commands us to repent, believe, have faith, etc. This is why unbelievers are justly sentenced to hell. Because God holds every person accountable. That's why unbelievers are justly sentenced to hell. Because He holds every individual that has ever lived accountable to the gospel truth. However, we have also learned that it is by God's grace alone that we are even able to repent, believe, have saving faith, etc. So on one hand, we're commanded. On the other hand, we recognize through Holy Scripture that it's by God's grace alone that we're, able, we're even able to meet these demands. And in fact, it gets even more interesting when, on one hand, we recognize that we are held personally responsible. Yet, on the other hand, we read John 6.44. Go there. John 6.44. So, on one hand, so this gets a little bit deeper, even. On one hand, we see that Scripture says that God holds us personally responsible. We are not robots. We've been given free will, or as theologians like to say, volition, or volitional responsibility. I don't care if you know the fancy word. Who cares? Do you understand that you're held responsible? to the sovereign God of the, of the universe, the holy God of the universe, that's the point. So we know that we're held personally responsible, but then, then we come upon scripture like this, John 6, what does it say? No one can come to me, Jesus speaking, the Lord, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Wait a minute, so I'm personally responsible, but yet no one can come to the Father or no one can come to the Father, no one can come to the Son even, unless the Father draws him through the Son to himself. Yeah. Yep. Up here on the board, uh, man cannot save himself. I gave you, uh, and Scott did as well in, in his review, uh, agiz, uh, ag uh, agonizomai, which means to strive, which is translated strive to enter through the narrow gate. Um, it means to agonize. It's like having a wrestling match. It's an athletic endeavor, even. It's hard. And that's what Jesus said. Strive. Strive to do this thing. Yet, you're not going to get there unless my Father draws you. So you have this somewhat paradox. But here's what we do know from Scripture as well. Man cannot save himself. Man is born totally enslaved unable to do anything for himself, particularly in saving himself. In fact, unless God elected him, he is never going to be saved. And God elected everyone who's ever going to be saved, period, before human history even started. So unless you're on that list, you're not going to be saved. Oh, wait a minute, this is just getting freaky. So how can a man be saved? Oh, there's that question again. With God, all things are possible. If God draws you, you're coming. If He wants you to hear the gospel and respond to it, you will. Go figure. So this, these kinds of think, these kinds of thoughts, you're, and I've been doing a lot of thinking because there's a lot of confused individuals out there. I'm convinced of this, pastors included, on this very simple topic. I think it comes down to one thing: that people are still in the Christian ranks, trying to rationalize things that are supernatural. They're trying to rationalize things that are supernatural. Well, how could you possibly do this? Well, how could you possibly do that? You were born in sin. How could you possibly repent? How could you possibly be responsible for believing? How could you possibly do this? 
And that's where everybody starts going awry. Because they're using human intellect to try to reason about the things of God. And God doesn't need to reason at our level. He says, this is the way it is. I'm going to hold you responsible. I'm going to make these demands on you, or else you're going to die in your sins. But here's the beauty of it. You ready? I'm going to give you everything you need to be saved. And the human, per- the, the human rationalist says, wait a minute, that's not calculating, right? The smoke starts coming out. And, and the theologians, you know what they do when they get confused? You ready? And I know this personally. You know what the- theologians do and some uh, spiffy little pastors do? When they get confused, they create bigger words to mask their confusion so that you don't question them, you see? They just make bigger words and multisyllabic contractions and hyphenations. And the longer they get, the fewer of you will question it because the stupider you'll feel. How do I know that? I was one of them. So these things give humans this conundrum, if you would. It does, especially for unfaithful people, as Holy Scripture states up here on the board, 1 Corinthians 2.14, but a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. So the Bible goes so far to say that, you know what, if you don't have the faculties to understand, the hearing, let's say, you're not going to hear. If God doesn't want you to hear the gospel at some point in your life, or he doesn't want to save you, then guess what? You're not going to be saved. Now, when we read the verse on the board, we must also remember the following scripture as well. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired. That's theonoustos. It means God breathed by God. So if we put these two truths together, the first one was 1 Corinthians 2.14, natural man can't accept the things of God. They are spiritually appraised. And then we have 2 Corinthians 3.16, all Scripture is inspired. God breathed by God. Putting these two truths together, we arrive at the simple conclusion that the natural man cannot understand God at least not the way you can, nor the things in His Word. That's what the Word says. And if a man cannot understand God, how far do you think simply reading the Bible will take that man? In other words, if you begin to speak Portuguese to an ape, right, Andrea? How far is it going to go? Don't know. Probably not very far. Why? Why? Because they don't understand Portuguese, that's why. How's that any different than an unregenerate person reading the Bible? Oh, they understand the English words, and the monkey's going to understand, hey, do you got a banana? What's up? Right? I see you got a banana there. I'll do whatever you say. Let me throw luggage around. You can film me and make a commercial out of it. (laughs) I'll do it. Right? Just give me my banana. But that's that's not spiritual understanding. That's almost... That's mimicry. And there's a lot of Christians in churches right now that are mimicking. That are religious. They're not saved. And that's what we've been fighting against for years now, frankly. So if a man cannot understand God, how far do you think simply reading the Bible will take that man? In other words, considering our previous passage, are you still at John 6.44? What does it say? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So do you see what the Spirit's synthesizing in your soul right now? If not, let me help you with a principle from Thursday. God saves, man is involved. I mean, God would be unjust if man wasn't involved in his own salvation. I mean, how could he sentence anybody to the lake of fire? They weren't involved somehow. But we know that God saves. A naturally minded person cannot understand the things of God. We just read that in 1 Corinthians 2.14. Such as man being called to repent, believe, have faith for salvation, while God is the only one able to grant them. In salvation, God's and man's wills are fused supernaturally, causing a naturally minded mind fits. 
natural minded man, excuse me. <laughs> Fits. It causes the natural mind. Why? Because you because they can't rationalize it. And if they're standing behind a pulpit, they just make bigger words to try to rationalize it. To say, I'm not stupid. I understand all this stuff. I just make bigger words. But God is not a God of confusion, is he? So where do these people get off making bigger words and complicating the gospel and then going out even worse and saying there's more than one gospel and getting even worse than that and say there's more than one this and there's more than one that when there's really only one? That there's more than one kingdom even? Wait a minute. Whoa, wait a minute. Slow down there, tiger. Are you, are you seriously trying to confuse people? Because you're doing a really good job right now. Because it seems to me, when I read the Bible, it seems very obvious. Jesus said, here I am. Take it or leave it. But you can't have me in the self-life. That's, your, that's what I want you to decide on. That's what you need to decide on. Because I'm going to hold you responsible. So you know in there there's a decision to be made. And don't you dare call that human works. Verse 44 again. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Now there's another interesting aspect of the gospel. The call itself. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Well, what's implied there? A really big thing that they're able to hear. Do you see it? Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Oh, wait a minute. You mean the Father only teaches ones that He chooses? Yeah. What did we just read in Scripture? No one comes to the Son unless the Father draws him. So the Father says, I will teach this one. I will make it abundantly clear to this one. I will till the soil. I will prepare the soil. I will save them. So this last phrase ought to echo in your souls as well. Consider that Jesus often said, or what Jesus often said, after he told the parable. What did he often say? Go to Mark 4.23. Mark 4.23. So I want you to hang on this John 6.45, which ended with, Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Well, there's an implication there, and that's what the Spirit's highlighting. Okay, the implication is stated simply in Mark 4.23. And this is something that Jesus would say after several parables, right? Or several truths, if you would, even. Mark 4.23 very simply says, If, doesn't say everybody, it says, If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Wait a minute, is this like some kind of a joke? No. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. If, up here on the board, he who has an ear. God alone enables spiritual hearing. A man can hear a holy scripture a hundred times and never get anything supernatural imparted to his account if God doesn't will it so. That's a fact. Again, God alone enables spiritual hearing. A man can hear Holy Scripture a hundred times and never get anything supernatural imparted to his account if God doesn't will it so. Mark 4.23, Revelation 2.7. Go to Revelation 2.7. Revelation 2.7. So you mean even hearing the truth and understanding it, and that's what's implied here, there's an understanding. Even hearing the truth is a gift, a grace gift from God? Absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. Because you were born without hearing. You were born in sin. The old sin nature wants nothing to do with God. So somehow, some way, God has to impart a certain kind of hearing to you. So that you can even hear the gospel. Revelation 2.7 He who has an ear... You see it? Let him hear what the Spirit says 
We just read, in what is it, 1 Corinthians 2.14, you cannot hear a, a, a spiritually dead person doesn't have hearing, can't appraise spiritually appraise things, can't hear the Spirit because they don't have hearing. So Scripture says, he who has an ear, in other words, he who has been given hearing from God himself as a grace gift, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So another reality for us to chew on is that God teaches us truth, but he also has to give us hearing. And all of that enables what we would call conversion. You'll never be converted unless you hear the truth. Well, who hears the truth? Well, I'm going to tell you this straight up, and this is the absolute truth. God decides. Not Pastor Ed. Not even how much you want somebody to hear the truth. You ever been, you know, basically shaking somebody and they won't listen? And no matter what you say, they just it falls on deaf ears, especially the gospel. It's because God hasn't given them hearing yet. That's the difference. So that's why you can't take it personal. Okay, go back to John 6.45. John 6.45. I hope you see what he's synthesizing. This is big stuff, my friends. Really big stuff. And for some reason, I know the reason, but I'm not going to go into it here. There are a lot of churches this morning, so-called Christian church, churches, that are confused about the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. They don't even understand this stuff. And they're leading people astray. And it's a crying shame. But what I know is that the Bible teaches that God's the one who gives hearing. That's why Jesus said, for those of you who have hear, ears, let them hear. If. Again, John 6.45 is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. The implication being that they're teachable that God has given them the ability to hear the truth at a supernatural level. So this is yet more evidence of the previous verse, which was verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's how he draws you. Do you understand? You hear the truth and you're drawn to it. How's that happen? God enabled it. That's how. All right, let's take a breather for a moment because I know that's a lot to think about. If we take all that the Spirit's been teaching us, given we have ears to hear as believers, I never make the absolute positive assumption that everybody hearing my voice right now is even a believer. I'd never make that assumption. How do I know that? Because like I said, at least five of you told me I was teaching you for years and you weren't saved until a year or so ago. So I know for a fact that if it can happen to those five, it can happen to the rest. But nonetheless, I'm assume I'll teach from a perspective the way that Paul would with his epistles. I will, he wrote from a perspective for believers, but he was never uh, confused about the fact that people that might read his letters might not be believers. So I'm going to teach that way. So if we take all that the Spirit's been teaching us, given we have ears to hear as believers, then we must conclude one basic eternal fact about our salvation. Are you ready? And just so you don't have to take my word for it, I'm going to give you Holy Scripture instead. Are you ready? Because maybe some of you have never seen the passage I'm about to reveal to you. Are you sure you're ready? Ta-da! Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Oh, I already know that one. Matter of fact, i got to memorize. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself it is a gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. You might be surprised how many people don't understand that. who lean on it at every chance they get. 
even teach a watered-down gospel based on it. But they still do not understand the greater grace of God. That is not the whole gospel. Is that a gospel truth? You bet. Phenomenal. Stupendous. Incredible. Lean on it. Love it. Embrace it. Holy. But that is not the whole of the gospel, my friends. It doesn't even mention Jesus. Yeah, I know. Because those aforementioned people, they're the same people who like to take the Gospels out of the equation. Say, oh, that's for a different dispensation. You know one of those big, long words? You remember dispensationalism? Find me that in the Bible, and I'll teach it. Dispensationalism. Do I have any problem with dispensations? No. Do I know they exist? Sure they do. But I'm not going to hack out my Lord's words because I'm ignorant about the truth about that. I'd be willing to bet that every one of you has a deeper appreciation for the passage on the board. And if not, you will. Why? Because in the face of all the demands that God places on man in order to be saved, the simple fact is that He is the one who gives us the means to meet said demands. So ask yourself one simple question, and do not forget the point on the board. If you're born totally depraved, a slave to sin itself, stuck in a pit so deep that you'll never make it out on your own, what hope do you have? None. And then along comes Jesus Christ with His gospel. A grace gift from our Father in heaven. That's what John 3.16 means. It's about Jesus. Who self-described His personal mission as to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10 and then when you see the big picture, salvation plan of God, it's then that you begin to truly, truly appreciate the passage on the board. It's when you see the big picture salvation plan of God and truly how much grace there is in His plan to save you, how much there has been if you're already saved, then you begin to tap the wellspring of what that means. That is not a punchline at a party like so many suggest. When you understand that every demand ever made on you to be righteous has and must be satisfied by the grace of God working in and through you, it's then that you get down on your knees and weep to the holy, sovereign, almighty God of the universe and say two words. You ready? Two simple words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The point made Thursday, God saves, man is involved. This is absolutely why the disciples contemplating salvation from the, quote, difficulty of human perspective ask the famous question, then who can be saved? Luke 18, 26, who can be saved? And speaking of giving thanks, what we are realizing is the following on this topic of repentance repentance leads us to gratitude Romans 8 1 says there's no condemnation in Christ right we're not gonna go to hell once we're saved just because we recognize in our repentant and contrite of sin in our lives that's not what I've been teaching at all so do not mince things or twist my words but I do know this, that repentance leads us to gratitude. 
that a repentant person is a grateful person. We give thanks when we realize how depraved we are and continue to be in the flesh. As God reveals more sin to us, we repent more, and we are that much more grateful, and so on. As King David intimated when he repented of his awful sin, Psalm 51.4, Against you, you only, I have sinned. That means a lot to us. It should mean a lot to us. And I think, I believe that the more mature you become, the more that means to you. The more you realize um, how much he's done for you. How incapable you are without him. And that's an everyday thing because God saves us how often? Daily. See, an unrepentant person doesn't get that. That's the point. A person whose gospel says, I'll save you now, but you can be repentant 30 years from now, doesn't get that. But I'm hoping you do. One other amazing principle the Spirit gave us on Thursday was one that requires a bit of concentration. And this was on the topic of understanding salvation. Just because we can theologically and even practically make distinctions between repentance and faith, they are eternally, intrinsically bound together. Why? Because a whole person cannot exercise faith that delivers them while remaining unrepentant. And vice versa, a whole person cannot exercise repentance that delivers while remaining unfaithful. The point is to get from sin to righteousness, right? If you don't turn away from sin, you know what we call that? Unrepentance. If you're not giving, saving, or delivering faith, then you don't get there. What are you turning to? That's what it means to be saved. You see, see, see most, people, ah, most people are more afraid of hell than they are of sin. Does that make sense? I don't know if that makes sense, but that's what I, but, but you see, the problem is, is that modern contemporary evangelism says, do you want to be saved from this pit of hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth? I guess so. That sounds horrible. Well, then believe this thing right here. Don't worry about repentance. Don't worry about any of this other stuff. Don't worry about the gospel call. Don't worry about what Jesus said because we dispensationalized him, big long word, out of the equation. Don't worry about any of that. Do you want a free ticket to heaven? <laughs> I do. I really do. Because I don't want to go there. Oh, here you go. Oh, here you go. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not the gospel that Jesus himself exuded, preached. His opening remarks about his own gospel, his own ministry was what? This is the guy who said, I came to seek and to save, right? His entire ministry was to seek and to save that which was lost. And the first thing, repent. (laughs) Because you can't get to there unless you repent here. I guess Jesus maybe didn't understand his own gospel. Or maybe there's more than one. Is that what we're supposed to postulate? Another big word. I can keep going. I'm no less stupid than the idiots who continue to use those words. Trust me. Intellectually, I match all of them, probably bury most of them. And I say that with complete humility because God gave me the brain I got. Big deal. You know what I know about that? It's what Paul said. Do I come to you with superiority of speech? I don't want to know Christ and Him crucified. Amen? Or do you want me to embarrass you? You want me to call you up here individually and, and, and browbeat you and play a SAT prep with you, if you know what that is. You, you see, I'm being a cocky jerk for a reason. You don't like me right now, do you? You don't like that thing, do you? Yeah. Well, that's standing behind pulpits this morning, and it's just a wolf in sheep's clothing, and it's wearing a smile, 
and it's lying through its teeth to people. So at least I'm honest, <laughs> right? A whole person cannot exercise faith that delivers them while remaining unrepentant and vice versa. A whole person cannot exercise repentance that delivers while remaining unfaithful. Now we're going to hear a lot from the following man this morning, Mr. Charles Spurgeon. Not that I should have favorites, but he is really one of my favorites. I don't know. Call me weak. Call me fleshly. He just, the man just knew how to preach it. It's just the way it is. I mean, what are you going to do? He was a gifted man. I think of a, uh, there's another Francis Chan. He's just a gifted preacher. What are you going to do? They're just awesome at preaching. And they have this knack for, a, and it doesn't mean he's better than me. I don't feel inferior at all. It's just when it comes to saying certain things, some people say it really well. And, and we should have no pride whatsoever to receive it from other people. That's why I showed you all whole video. Scott's like, yeah, you're going to kick me out. You're going to kick yourself out. Remember the last two couple of Tuesdays ago when I showed you Sproul? Scott's like, fuck, fuck, fuck. I really want to teach that day. So, you know, you get this old guy. He's not even alive anymore. You know what I'm saying? Sorry. We shouldn't have that kind of pride, Scott. You know, when, when, when it's time to let somebody else in the saddle. Do you know what I'm saying? When, you know what I'm saying, Scott? That's good, that's good. Right? We shouldn't have that kind of pride ever. Ever. And we shouldn't do what a lot of people do, which is we only go to dead people. Because they're like, you know, not a threat. That's petty and disgusting. If someone has something good to say, hey, we should listen. Like I said, I'm an imperfect teacher. Just like Mr. Spurgeon here would readily have admitted. Just like Paul admitted. But Jesus never had to. Nonetheless, we're going to hear a lot from Mr. Spurgeon this morning. This is what he has to say. I learn from the scriptures that repentance is just as necessary to salvation as faith is. And the faith that has not repentance going with it will have to be repented of. Let me say that again in case you missed it. In case you don't believe little old Pastor Collins from that little puny church on the hill. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll agree with this great preacher of the ages. I learned from the scriptures that repentance is just as necessary to salvation as faith is. And, the faith, and that faith that has not repentance going with it will have to be repented of. Why is this so? Up here on the board. Understanding deliverance. Because a man's heart is affected by God's grace, and though he must repent and have faith, only a whole person is able to function in either, and therefore intrinsically, both at any given point in time, where the end result is salvation slash deliverance. I know that's a mouthful, but all the Spirit's really saying is, listen, this is a whole person consideration. These are heart issues. These are will issues. These are mind issues, all in one ball of wax. In other words, a repentant heart is a faithful one, and a faithful heart is a repentant one. And to our previous point about spiritual hearing, go to Matthew 22, 14. Matthew 22, verse 14. So take all that with you. And to our previous point about spiritual hearing... Matthew twenty two fourteen. For many are called. Um, what did we just learn about being called? A person must hear the calling. A person must be able to hear. Because God is the one who gives them the faculty to hear. And then draws them to his son. Right? For many are called, a person must hear the calling, but few are chosen. In other words, not all hear. Now that may bother you, but that's not the point. The point is what Holy Scripture says. 
And it isn't until we start trying to rationalize on human terms that things become really complicated. It's not complicated at all. If God wants you to hear the gospel and then he wants to save you, you know what's going to happen? You're going to be saved. Because God's not impotent. God is all-powerful. But this is what Scripture says, for many are called, but few are chosen. This begs our attention. Be given in this moment to the precious words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go to John 10, 25. John 10, 25. Well, what did Jesus have to say about this? Since we don't, big long word, dispensationalize Him out of the picture, God forbid, what did Jesus say about this whole thing? about this calling, about spiritual hearing, about our abilities to be drawn to God through Jesus. John 10, 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. I love this. See, I, whenever I think I'm being impatient with people, I just have to go to Jesus. You know, the guy that said, how long am I going to have to stay with this ridiculous generation? Right? And he flipped over tables and you know the thing. He's like, he said, I already told you. I told you. You don't believe me. Okay. The works that I do in my father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep, my sheep. I'm the great shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me. That's the mark of a true Christian. Do you understand? That's the mark of a true Christian. They follow the Lord. Because <laughs> He's our shepherd. What do you expect out of a sheep under that shepherd? Where are they going to go? That's what Peter said, right? Where else are we going to go? For truth. Where are we going to go after this? I know the truth now. You've given it to me. You saved me. You changed my heart. You made me new. The, the, you're my true north. What am I going to do? You go over there, I go over there. I might disobey and go in the thicket and go, you know, and you're going to pull me out again. And then you have that, uh, that under-shepherd guy with the bald guy. He's beating me out of the bush, right? And it's like, blah, blah, blah. and I get mad at him, but not you, Lord. I love you. Yeah. That's the earmark of a true Christian. Do you get it? I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Why do you want to mince words? He says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Any questions? Why does everybody got a problem with that? Oh, because you see, dispensationally, I'm Daffy Duck now, right? Dispensationally, Jesus' words don't matter. Repentance and saving faith. No, Charles Spurgeon, Jesus, Paul, they're all idiots. You don't have to repent. Just believe, believe this here coin right here. And we'll deal with repentance a lot later. Oh, man. That's not what Jesus said at all. Jesus said it right there. Am I reading a different Bible than you? What does verse 27 say? He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And you know what they do? They follow me. Why is that so hard for people? Why is that so hard? Because human rationalism makes it hard. That's why. I'll tell you this. I'll, I'll tell you this. You ready? The only reason I have a job, I think, 99% of my job is to ferret through the ridiculousness that you guys believe in your flesh and all the lies that you've taken in over the years. My job would be so easy if you didn't come to the table with all these lies. All I have to say is, you ready? One time I'd have to say it. Okay, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Let's go have another potluck. What do you say, Melody? Right? Let's just have a potluck every week. It'd be, my job would be easy, but that's not what happens, is it? No, you guys come to the table with ridiculous... What? Garbage. Things you've learned from false teachers, things you've learned from the television or the radio or at school. I mean, that's my, that's my problem, is you show up with garbage. You're all in the thicket. But I don't see the difficulty here. Do you? My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. 
What does he say to the false pretenders, the pretender Christians? I never knew you. See, I know my sheep. But these posers over here, I don't know them. Because you know what? They don't follow me. They do the religious song and dance, but they're not actually following me. I, I hate to do this. To, I'm going to hack them. But I, was, I did ask, Scott sent me a little blip from Mr. Francis Chan yesterday, and it was phenomenal. And I'm going to borrow, and I'm going to butcher it, but again, excuse me. He said, this is what most so-called Christians think. They're driving their car, and they say, they pop the trunk and say, Jesus, get in. I could use you a little bit later when my, time, when my life gets difficult. Oh, no, 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 better yet, Jesus, I'll open up the back door. Why don't you get in the back door? Times are getting a little rough. I'm, I'm a little achy. And, I, you know, let's at least have some conversations. But I, I want to take you where I'm going. I'm going in this direction. You get in my car. I'm going to drive. You go. No, no, no. Better yet, we're buddies now. You get in the front seat. Right? Because times are getting tough for me. That's very different than a person who gets out of the car and says, Jesus, here's the keys. You drive. Do you understand? That's very different. <laughs> Most people want Jesus to get in a trunk <laughs> and pop him out when, like, a, like, he, like they want to abuse him, like a rebound guy, when he's your husband. Well, he should be. But this is what I'm trying to say. People that treat Jesus like that, I don't believe they're saved. That's what I've been trying to teach for years now. That's my great fear. People that have Jesus in the trunk and are still driving in the direction that they were driving before they were so-called saved aren't saved because he said they follow him. How are you following him if you're driving the car? This isn't rocket science at all. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me, verse 28, and I give eternal life to them. Do you see who he gives eternal life to? Those people, the ones that are following him. That's the earmark of a true Christian. Are you following the Lord? And do not underplay the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ like some do. Because that's also echoes of the same group of People that say, oh, you don't have to repent. Because repent would mean you take on a new Lord. Because when you're born, you're under the Lordship of sin. And when you're saved, you transfer it to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Or slash righteousness. He says, I give, them a, a, I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. In other words, we're resolute on this. Make no mistake about it. This is the way it is. My sheep follow me, and I give them eternal life, and no one's going to snatch them out of my hand. All I can say to you is that God gives us this supernatural ability to hear the gospel call, more specifically, to hear Jesus, our great shepherd, calling out to his own sheep. And as the backdrop of that, we are born totally deaf. We are born totally deaf. And by the grace of God, he gives us hearing. So that we can hear our great shepherd. Do you understand? Is that difficult? What's the problem then? Why is my job so difficult all the time? Why well, got to worry about people from even from without this church attacking the church? Why well, got to worry about that kind of stuff? You know why? Because people will never change. That's why. People are their own gods. People want to be the defining sovereignty in their own lives. They don't really want to surrender to God. And Many of them, frankly, haven't. Because narrow is the way that leads to life. And broad is the way that leads to what? Destruction. Did I say that? Nope. That's in the Bible. That's Jesus. 
I'm the jerk for teaching it. So we're born deaf. God gives us hearing, as the Bible teaches us, up here on the board. And every time I think of this, I think of Bill Johnson. You lucky dog. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Well, what if you're deaf still? What if God says, I'm not going to give you hearing? If you have ears to hear... For those with hearing, let them hear. You're born totally deaf. Who do you have to depend on for hearing then? God. If you're an arrogant SOB, you think you're going to get hearing? What do you think? God gives grace to who? Well, there you go. What's the problem? An arrogant person says, Jesus, get in the trunk. A humble person says, here's the keys. Any questions? And this is one of the things I love about God. He says, I'm not going to be mocked by you. If I don't want you to hear my pearls, you ain't hearing them. Oh, sure, you can run off and pontificate. Another long word, by the way. You can go off and pontificate with your buddies at tea parties. You can even stick your little pinky out that I made for you and sip your little tea and act smart, and throw big words at, at people that are beating their breath saying, save me. And do all kinds of damage to my son's good name. I'll even let you do that. But you know what? You're not getting the good stuff. As Solomon would say, go ahead, enjoy your life. This is as good as it's going to be for you. Love it. Love it. You know why? Because he's the sovereign God. And if we don't respect him, what do you expect to get? Blessings? You want to disrespect the, the holy God of the universe by saying, Jesus, get in the trunk? He's going to say, I, I'm not going to give you any hearing because you don't want to hear what I have to say. My very existence is offensive to your little sovereignty that you've got going on in your little existence. So I'm not even going to give you a hearing. So much has to be accomplished by God, yet the unmistakable truth is that we individuals are held personally responsible if we refuse His grace. That is where repentance comes in. Specifically, as we've been learning, because a person must turn their backs on the self-life in order to be saved. And he'll even help us with that. (laughs) Because what kind of sinful idiot can do that even? But let's not say that that thing doesn't exist, repentance, when God demands it. All we have to recognize is that he also gives us and enables us by grace the ability to do these things. So a person must turn their backs on the self-life in order to be saved, both as an unbeliever and then later even as a saved, delivered, or saved, being saved or delivered as a believer. We have a repentant heart. Is anybody in here going to go out on a limb and say that they haven't sinned since they've been saved? What did we learn from David's example? He was saved. His, he was basically wasting away from the inside out until he repented. So this pattern up here on the board regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ, God is looking for the will of man, which intrinsically involves a whole person. A person must be given to in order to be quickened to. And someone asked me about what quickened means. I, I, I'm sorry again, I'm not a perfect teacher. Ta-da! Surprise. I'm like, well, I don't understand what quicken means. It's just a theological term. And instead of doing it, I'm just going to let the man... I don't mean to say that the wrong way. I don't think of him that way, but you know what I mean. He's just a really good preacher. Charles Spurgeon, maybe he can help you out with a context, using the word quicken in context. It is God that chooses His people. He calls them by His grace. 
He quickens them by His Spirit and keeps them by His power. Does that help? I hope. Again, it is God that chooses His people. He calls them by His grace. He quickens them by His Spirit and keeps them by His power. So you see, quickens, the theological term quicken means that, okay, you're here, right? And you need to get here. And there's all this striving and agonizing and conversion stuff and all that stuff. Well, who's going to enable you to get from here, which is complete destitution in sin, to this thing? We call it quickening. He's so powerful, he just goes, I'm just going to make it happen. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, you're going to hear, you're going to hear the gospel, you're going to repent, I'm going to give you saving faith, I'm going to quicken the whole thing by the power of the Spirit. You see it? Knowing that you are held responsible. You see? Because you can get really goofy. You say, well, wait a minute. Sounds like God's doing everything. And this is like, I have no free will. But you do. But you do. Because God pays attention to it. And he won't save a person who's unwilling to be saved. Does that make sense? There you go. That's what it means to be quickened, though. To the willing person, to the humble person, however you'd like to think about it, it happens by the grace of God. Or else Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 would be false. Lest we'd have something to boast about, right? Salvation is never the result of works, ever. And if you not understand what James was saying with greater grace, you understand that repentance, saving faith, even believing... All part of a greater grace. Even the best intentioned pastor like myself cannot deliver a person from their problems. That's why people rarely come to me for counsel. Way less than in previous years. And it's not because I can't give them biblically sound advice. I really can. And some people I still do. It's that I give them biblically sound advice. That's the problem. That's why they don't come to me anymore. You want, you want a little secret? Some of you are like, oh man, that guy's on to me. Most people that ask me for guidance already know the right answer. It takes me like two seconds. I'm like, this person already knows. What, they already know the right answer. But I let them go. I'm like, yep. Oh yeah. Yep. Yep. Here's the point. They're waiting for me to screw up. They want, they want someone to blame if I give them a wrong answer. That's what it basically comes down to. 99% of the time, they already know the right answer. Should I do this? <laughs> you already know the answer, don't you? You want me to tell you something contrary to what you know is actually true, what the Spirit's been convicting you of, so you can blame me later. Well, Pastor said I should do this. Here's your divorce papers. Here's your, I don't know, here's your suitcase. Get the hell out. I just, and then I get a phone call. Hey, what'd you say to my wife? <laughs> I'm out here on the street. I'm cold. <laughs> they don't want to hear it. See what I'm saying? That's how people are. They don't want the truth. They want someone to blame. That's why, what have I always said for years now from this pulpit? If you don't believe what I'm teaching and preaching, then do like the Bereans. Search it out for yourself. That's the best I can ever hope for. I want you to be, have your own convictions. I don't want you to take my word for it. I just told you I'm an imperfect teacher. I'm a bus driver, and I go over potholes sometimes. I miss them. <laughs> Oops, sorry, guys. Right? Look out the window. You see that right there? Oh, isn't that awesome? Yeah, and we can rejoice together, but I'm not perfect. So that means, by default, I want, you to, I want you to do this very thing. I know it's a stretch for some people. Open up your Bible and read it. In any case, the point the Spirit's making up here on the board, 1 Corinthians 3, 7, So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. I'm not going to deliver you. I'm not meant to deliver you. I'm a bus driver. That's about it, and I'm totally happy with that. All right, let's make our way back, and I'm going to pick a spot here pretty soon. We've got to make our way back to our primary course of study. What is repentance, and who gets to define it? 
As I left off last week, <clears throat> the truth is that in order to find the answers to those questions, we must base everything on the gospel itself. It's inescapable. It's impossible to speak of biblical repentance in the absence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's impossible. And that's one of the errors I believe a lot of people make. They want to dice things up. Don't dice it up. Talk about repentance as part of the gospel. Because it really is. And I don't care if you say, oh, it's not the gospel. I don't care. What I care is that you understand what Jesus had to say about his own gospel. About what Jesus had to say about del being delivered from the sovereignty of sin to the sovereignty of righteousness. Not from the throes of hell to heaven. The sovereignty of sin to the sovereignty of righteousness. That's what I want you to understand. And as soon as you understand that's the problem, not that other weird one. Not the destination one the actual one, then you realize that repentance has to be a part of the equation. So let me give you Spurgeon's viewpoint on the topic of repentance, and I'd like to read some scripture with you and then quote him after each verse, if you don't mind. Go to Matthew 4.17. Matthew 4.17. Because I really do want you to think about this. I, I, I'm trying to... I, and what the Spirit's basically saying is, you know, there are other men that have and do still stand behind pulpits that are teaching the truth. It's just that they're dwindling because nobody wants to stand up for it anymore. Everybody wants to accommodate man in contemporary Christianity because you know what? The truth is offensive. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Charles Spurgeon on that up here on the board. He, Jesus, was not afraid to give an earnest exhortation to sinners and to bid men repent. He knew better than we do the inability of men concerning all that is good, yet he bade them repent. Yeah. So let's look at another place of Holy Scripture where Jesus said, repent. Go to Mar uh, yeah, Mark 1.14. Mark 1.14. Mark 1.14. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. And saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Up here on the board, from Mr. Spurgeon. It is clear from this passage that our Lord exhorted men, exhort just means encourage, exhorted men to repent and to believe the gospel. There are some who profess to be his followers who will not suffer us to do this. Up here on the board. We may teach men and warn them, they say these people that are wrong, but we must not exhort them to repent and believe. Well, he says, as the contention of these people is not in accordance with the Scriptures, we are content to follow the Scriptures and to do as Jesus did. So we shall say to sinners, repent ye and believe the Gospel. <laughs> yeah. So let's do as Jesus did. Instead of, to, to, excuse my French, but to hell with accommodating the sensibilities of contemporary man. To hell with them. Because that's where those things come from. The pit of hell. We ought to be out there preaching the truth, my friends. Not what is convenient. Or shall I say, accommodating to man. I told you I was going to give you a lot of Spurgeon up here on the board. Here's another one I loved. Christ and we will never be one until we and our sin are two. Just think about that. You're a new man if you're saved. Christ and we will never be one until we and our sin are two. We ought to preach the same words that Jesus preached. Go to Matthew 16, 25. Matthew 16, 25.
That's what it means to be crucified. That's what Spurgeon was saying. That's what it means to be crucified in Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In other words, you're identifying with his death. You are now, as Paul would write in Romans, dead to sin. Sin is dead to you. Matthew 16, 25. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I'll give you an old friend from down south, J. Vernon McGee, up here on the board. The person who will not assume the risks involved in becoming a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ will, in the long run, lose his life eternally. You see, I'm not the only person in history. Far be it. Some of you need to get out of your own little microcosm, another big word, your own little uh, world, and spread your wings a little bit and open your eyes and realize that we live in a dung hole. You follow? And some of you are friendly with dung beetles, people who eat it for their lunch, not to be gross. And these people call themselves Christians. And they lie to you about the gospel. And they tell you Jesus' words don't count today. And they lie to you. Well, I'm not going to lie to you. And you can hate me for doing it, for calling such, such things out in your life, but I don't care. I'm not here. I serve the Lord. And if the Lord had something to say about His own gospel and about the salvation plan of His Father, I want, you, I want it front and center in your life because I love you. Here's another highly respected theologian worth your consideration. A.W. Pink. The nature of Christ's salvation is woefully misrepresented by the present-day evangelists. He announces a Savior from hell rather than a Savior from sin. And that is why so many are fatally deceived. For there are multitudes who wish to escape the lake of fire who have no desire to be delivered from their carnality and worldliness. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. One of the reasons I'm giving you all these accomplished theologians from the past is so that you fully know and recognize that what I'm teaching is actually orthodox Christianity. What I'm teaching you is actually orthodox Christianity. Christianity existed before any of the schisms in the church. We're going all the way back to the early church, my friends. You know, the thing that's encapsulated here, like in the book of Acts. Because that's what matters. And who is the head of the church? Jesus Christ. And wives are supposed to what? Respect their husbands? Um, How do we respect something if we throw everything he said out in the garbage? Or he was just talking moralisms. Another big word. That's what people do. But that's not orthodox Christianity. That's something else. That's contemporary Christianity. So while I realize it flies in the face of contemporary Christianity with its many forms and perversions, what I'm teaching you is nonetheless orthodox. It is biblical. And like I said earlier, if you don't believe me, read your Bible. Don't hang on anyone's words. Spurgeon's, Pink's, uh, McGee. Don't hang on mine. Don't hang on any of our words. Go read it for yourself. One of the things I was telling DJ before class is that one of the beautiful things about contentions in the church is that the honest people always arrive at the truth because they seek it. They say, I don't like that scratch my, like the Bereans, right? I don't know 
about that one? Let me go look. Oh, I see it now. And if they don't, then they bring it up. Or they do whatever they need to do. It's the lazy people. It's the contemporary Christian that has Jesus in the trunk and says, man, if I put him like right here, if I put him like right here shotgun, he's going to nag me the whole time. He's going to tell me I'm going in the wrong direction. I don't want to hear that. If I, dang, God forbid I give him the keys. He's going to turn this car right around. I was going to Vegas, man. He's going to turn this, he's going to turn this car right around. I don't want that. I don't want to turn the car around, you see. And Jesus is like, but you got to. That's what he meant when he said what he said. What does it profit a man, you know? So, yeah, it's true. What I teach flies in the face of contemporary Christianity. But it's orthodox. It's biblical. And I, for one, am very grateful for the men I've quoted so far this morning for standing up for the one true gospel of Jesus Christ. And I hope you are as encouraged by their words as I am. I'll just finish with a couple few more quotes from another individual, James Montgomery Boyce, up here on the board. He said, We often hear the, quote, Savior characteristics of God stressed, His love, mercy, goodness, and so on. But the matter of His Lordship is absent. The distortion is particularly clear in evangelism. In modern practice, the call to repentance is usually called a, quote, invitation, which one can obviously accept or refuse. It is offered politely. Seldom do we hear presented God's sovereign demand to repent or His demand for total submission to the authority of His appointed King, Christ Jesus. I didn't say that. I wonder what King David would think of contemporary Christianity in light of, say, Pastor Boyce's words here. I wonder if King David was to be shotgunned right out of heaven right now and stood here, right? He'd probably be about this tall, but that doesn't matter. Not that it matters. But he would be standing here and wonder what he would think. What would he be saying to me? He'd probably say, go get him, man. Do that thing. You, 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 you remember his heart towards the Lord? He was that guy that said, how dare you offend my Lord? And he was like this, I'll, I'll take the giant on, I don't care. Who's this that blasphemes my Lord? Right? Little David against a nine-foot giant. And he took him down. How? By faith. He didn't, he didn't stand up for the garbage that's in Christian, contemporary Christianity right now. He'd be flipping out. He'd be flipping out. And he'd probably want to take a few pastors out along the way. Probably drag them out by their ears and say, shame on you. And then kick them in a tush and say, burn your pulpit. It's ungodly. Could have done the same thing to me a few years back. That's why we don't judge. We pray. Keep on pressing on. We, keep, we teach the truth. We preach the truth. And if honest, people are honest about it, eventually they become orthodox. to the one true gospel of Jesus Christ. So I do wonder about that kind of stuff. What, King, what would King David think of contemporary Christianity if he were alive today? He'd be disgusted. That's what I believe. He'd be completely and utterly disgusted. And he'd probably call it what it is, not Christianity. He'd say, that's not Christianity. That's not my Lord working in you. That's the God of this world working in you. Because a true Christian follows the Lord. A true Christian doesn't put him in the trunk of his car as a convenience, as a rebound man. A true Christian, I don't know about you, but that's what I long for. That's my prayer. Lead me. Show me the way. 
I'm obviously a wretched fool, Lord. Show me the way. Show me the way out of this thing. Yes, I'm in the thicket again. Show me the way out. Who else am I going to turn to? That was David's example. A repentant heart is a remorseful one. It is the same heart that seeks salvation and deliverance by the hand of God, namely by His grace. And I'll close with this, because um, like I said, the church is under attack right now. Don't worry about it, it's nothing new. But anytime you teach this kind of truth, you get barbs thrown at you. You get spears thrown at you. You get accusations thrown at you. So be it. I want you all to be clear, and this is me speaking, Ed Collins. I believe the Bible teaches these things. Not only these things, obviously, but these things. So do not ever misconstrue my words. Jesus preached repentance. Jesus preached belief in himself. God is all sufficient in his saving grace. Man is held accountable by God in salvation. And God elected and draws every believer to Christ. Those are the things I believe. If you refute any of them, I literally encourage you, go to the Bible and find out why you have a problem with them. Because this is what I believe. And just for the record, whenever I or this church gets attacked, these things never seem to make it to the forefront. They're a bunch of moronic idiots. They start saying, oh, this is what he's teaching, and this is what so-and-so, this is, this is what he... No. Unless you've been here for the last three years, shut your mouth. So I want you to know, that's what I believe. And I wanted it part of my outline. So that any idiot that comes to the website looking to cast a stone can see that. And realize that I have never done anything but embrace the grace of God. And I would argue to a much greater de degree than most of the idiots that are looking to throw stones. So any questions, you know where I'm at. And I ask that you never misconstrue anything that I believe. If you have any questions about anything, and I mean anything, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm here. I have no problem uh, responding to you, if you have questions, if you want to do something privately or anything like that, or someone's bothering you, that's the other one. If anybody reaches into this congregation and starts bothering you, I want to know about it. That may take a little flight. I'm kidding. <laughs> or a little drive. Give me an address. <laughs> no, nah, that's no way. There's no way. I'm not going to let that happen. That's one of the things that a shepherd does. I will fight for you. And if someone's bothering you, I want to know about it. Because I'll pummel them. I don't mean physically. Maybe. <laughs> I just don't want people messing with you. Is that fair? All right? Love you. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to gather together as family, to break bread together. That is the very bread of life. That is the word of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your precious Son, who you sent to take away our sins, to solve that problem that we had, that we were born with, to reach across the chasm by grace to save us. Father, we're so very grateful. We just ask for your blessings as we take these things out to a lost and dying world, Father, that needs them so desperately. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Thank you.